from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up today on Ag Day, hit by a hurricane, Georgia's cotton producers look to this year's harvest and to the future. We, we don't want that entire crop to be uh, open to storm damage at one time. A third day brings a third buy of U.S. ag product by China. Concerns grow as another Michigan farmer battles a life-threatening virus. So the seasonality of the timing right now is not uncommon, um, but the number of cases certainly is. Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Betsy Jibben. Clinton is on assignment. A second farmer is now ill, possibly from a rare mosquito-borne virus. The virus is called Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or Triple E. A GoFundMe page has been established for Jim Whitwright of Eau Claire in southern Michigan. The site states that last month, Whitwright became very sick with a high fever and was rushed to the hospital. It says he has been in critical condition in ICU for four weeks. This is the second possible case involving a farmer in that area. Earlier this week, we told you about fruit farmer Bill Teichman of Tremendous Fruit Farm, who was also hospitalized with the virus. Six horses have died from the disease in Barry, Kalamazoo, and St. Joseph counties. None of the horses were vaccinated, and they've all died. The eastern equine encephalitis tends to peak in late summer or early fall, so the seasonality of the timing right now is not uncommon, um, but the number of cases certainly is. Eastern equine encephalitis remains a extremely rare illness. Um, it is not something that you know is going to be widespread. Conrad says a person has a much better chance of contracting West Nile or Lyme diseases than Triple E. The Indiana State Department of Health says Eastern Equine Encephalitis has been found in three horses in a cluster of mosquitoes in a county in northern Indiana. No Indiana residents have been diagnosed, but deaths have been reported in Michigan, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Some facts about Triple E. It is one of the most dangerous mosquito-borne diseases in the U.S., with a 33% death rate in people who become ill and a 90% death rate in horses that become ill. People can be infected from the bite of a mosquito carrying the viruses. So what can you do to protect yourself? Health experts recommend that you use an insect repellent that contains DEET, wear long sleeve shirts and long pants when outdoors, and empty water from mosquito breeding sites around your home. Signs of triple E include the sudden onset of fever, chills, body and joint aches. We have more advice on how to protect yourself and your horses on our website, agday.com. Scroll down to news links. USDA announcing another flash sale of soybeans to China on Tuesday, this time 260,000 metric tons. That follows Monday's announcement by USDA for a purchase by China of 256,000 metric tons of soybeans and last week's announcement of the 204 metric ton buy. That brings the total in the past week to 720,000 metric tons. China announced earlier this month it would not add additional tariffs on American soybeans. And it looks like trade talks with China are moving forward. The official Chinese news agency saying a government cabinet official is leaving for Washington today to prepare for trade negotiations. It's reported the deputy finance minister for China will lead a delegation to Washington to, quote, pave the way for the 13th round of negotiations. The report gave no details on a possible agenda. South Korea is calling 4,000 pigs. That's after confirming African swine fever at a farm near its border with North Korea. This video from the Associated Press claims to show excavators in the distance burying pigs. The farm barricaded off with officials in protective clothing. South Korea's agricultural minister says the country's first case of the highly contagious disease was confirmed Tuesday in tests on five pigs that died Monday evening at the farm. Meanwhile, South Korea's prime minister said the government has raised the crisis level to its highest level. He has expressed fear the South Korean pig farm industry could be seriously damaged by the disease. More folks are climbing back in the combines to do a little harvesting, but it's what happens at the end of the day sometimes that makes the most memories, as meteorologist Cindy Clausen shows us in today's crop comments. Well, Betsy, those sunsets can be spectacular this time of the year. Dominic Hunt sharing this picture with us. Dominic says this was taken as he was finishing up wheat harvest in Niagara, North Dakota. 
Wow, check that out. That is beautiful. And it looks like Keith may have had a little help too. Well, let's take a look at our wind speed forecast as we head through the day today. We're going to be seeing those stronger winds, especially in the upper Midwest and northern plains, and they'll start to get a little windy into the much of the western states as well. Overnight, we lose most of those winds, still a bit on the breezy side in the Great Lakes. You could see some of the winds from Imelda kind of starting to really affect the Gulf Coast of Texas. And as we head through our Thursday, we'll see the strongest winds, especially out towards the Four Corners region. Stay tuned. We'll have your national forecast coming up. Introducing Farm Journal TV on demand 24 7. Ag Day, Machinery Pete TV, U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. You might remember the film about a guy who ate fast food for an entire month. Now, filmmaker Morgan Spurlock is back, and this time he's taking on the chicken industry. The film is called Super Size Me 2 Holy Chicken. Viewers watch as the filmmaker goes to Alabama to learn about chicken farming and raising his own chickens. The film follows the process all the way until Spurlock opens his own chicken restaurant called Holy Chicken in Central Ohio. Spurlock takes on terms such as all natural, cage free and hormone free. What you hope is that maybe on the heels of this, we can give a few more farmers the courage to know that their lives won't be completely devastated by speaking out that there is strength in numbers, that there's a way for them to join together to fight against the, the awful tournament system, the awful kind of, the awful kind of uh, it, there is a tremendous amount of collusion that's happening between these companies to drive prices down, to drive competition down. So, you know, the, that's what you hope. You hope that out of this will come a, a lot more justice for guys like that. Despite his skeptical view of the industry, Spurlock says he thinks fast food can be ethical and affordable. He says consumers may have to pay a little bit more to support independent farmers and restaurant chains that pay higher wages. Still ahead, what new government data has to say about pesticides in the food we eat. And later, cotton farmers in Georgia suffered big losses last year due to a hurricane. As harvest begins, we check on this year's crop. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Trying to lock in some profits later this year? Clinton Griffiths talks with Brian Split about what you should be looking at when it comes to the corn market. Brian Split with agmarket.net, our guest today. Brian, let's talk about not just this year's crop because we know harvest is just around the corner at this right. point, if not started for folks a little further south. But you know, as we start to make plans for the end of this year and hopefully for next year, what things are you watching and looking for chances to be profitable? Well, one thing I'd like to impress upon producers is that uh, you don't have to focus specifically on one production year at a time. Okay. And uh, one of the things, if you look at the history of December corn contracts over the last five years, so that would be December 15, 16, 17, 18, and this year, 19, uh, we have consistently made lows, whether it's late winter into spring or even late spring, just before summer, somewhere between the low end of 362 and a half per bushel up to the highest low for a, a late winter spring low was 379 and a quarter. So when you look at December 20 values approaching 410 right now, I think it does make sense to start looking at locking in a portion of your production. Um, we've seen the CME group increase the, the uh, carry in the market, so now the spreads can get wider, assuming that we have ample production. So I think it's a, a safe bet that if you can look at 410 December corn and then at some point next spring, uh, think that you should have the spread between December and July get to 30 cents. You could roll your D's 410 sale to July, mm -hmm. giving you 440 July corn. I think for most producers, that should be able to work for them. Uh, also, you don't have to sit on that sale forever. Let's say you had 410 and we saw the market go to 380 or 365 or somewhere in that window. You could always just take, take that value, put it in the bank, and use that towards the rest of your marketing year. So that's something else to consider. So that's how it works on corn. What about soybeans? Is it a similar story? So for soybeans, there's a couple of things maybe to keep in mind. Uh, the highest price for November 19 soybeans this summer during all the weather excitement was 948. The highest price that we had 
at the back end of winter was 971. So when you think about November 20 values right now, uh, we've been trading just between that 950 to 960 area recently. So might be something to consider there uh, beginning your marketing program. And also from the spread perspective, similar to corn, we've been seeing about a 50 cent carry between November and July soybeans. So uh, looking at November beans around 950 and then the potential to roll that to July at a 50 cent carry gives you $10 soybeans. That may not be a bad place to start. Not too bad as we uh, look out to another year. Appreciate it, Brian. Thanks so much. We'll be back with more AgTech coming up. Just a to contact Brian Split at Ag Market, call 844 4AG Market or visit their website at www.agmarket.net. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. with meteorologist Cindy Clausen. Cindy, it's clear we are in hurricane season. We have a tropical storm, Imelda, here right on the coast of Texas. What can we expect? Well, a lot of rain for sure. That's going to be the main uh, real impact is the rain, obviously the storm surge, so flooding is probably going to be the biggest impact that we see from Imelda. So let's take a look at the map and see what's going on. Imelda is not a very big storm like what we are seeing with Umberto, what we saw with Dorian, but it's going to be packing a lot of moisture with it. And again, that's going to be one of the biggest impacts as that really doesn't make a lot of movement. So watch for some heavy rains in the southeastern part of Texas, eastern part of Texas, even up into Louisiana. We're going to see some of that rain moving through as well. Now, other parts of the country, we do have a front in the nation's midsection, upper Midwest. That's going to be heading into the Great Lakes, or at least the upper Great Lakes, and then in the Pacific. Pacific Northwest, we have some rain with a system there. Moving into the overnight hours, it's really Melda, really not making a whole lot of movement, dumping a lot of rain into parts of eastern Texas. We'll start to see some showers and thunderstorms into parts of the Great Lakes as we get as we get into Thursday morning, and we'll still see some moisture out into the northwest. Now, as we get into the day Thursday, a lot of that system that uh, is into the Midwest starts to head, dive more south because we have that ridge in place. I think it overdoes the moisture over here in parts of the Corn Belt. But again, the real focus tomorrow and the next couple of days is going to be Imelda. All right, let's look a look at our precipitation estimate. Now this is the past 24 hours and this is just an estimate, but you can see we already had well over three inches of rain and you add the next 24 hours. Our model is over 10 inches of rain right here in this far southeastern part of Texas, well over 10 inches. Obviously, we're going to be dealing with some flooding issues with this storm. All right, let's take a look then at our temperatures, and you can see right where Imelda is, it's going to be much cooler there, but surrounding that, we're seeing a lot of 90s, even 80s, all the way up into the upper Midwest. We're looking at those cooler 60s in the northwest and even into the far northeast as well, but that ridge holding strong in the nation's midsection, keeping that warmth there. Tomorrow, into the overnight hours we go, down into the 30s and 40s, 40s in the far northeast, 50s in the northwest, very warm and muggy in the mid nation's midsection, 60s and 70s there. And then tomorrow we'll see those temperatures uh, once again pretty warm in the nation's midsection and cool in the top corners of the country. Jet stream quickly showing that we still have that jet stream holding or the ridge holding strong. And then there's that trough in the northwest. You've been seeing that rain over there the past couple of days. That trough will move to the east. The ridge shifts off to the east as well. Things come a little more zonal over the weekend, but then it looks like maybe a cutoff in the southwest as we get into the middle of next week. That's your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Cascade, Idaho, cooler with showers and thunderstorms today with a high of 55 degrees. Salem, Indiana, mostly sunny and hot for you with a high of 88 degrees. And Canton, New York, plenty of sunshine with a high of 72 degrees. Coming up, online grocery shopping is becoming so popular one retailer is expanding its business with it. Plus what the FDA has to say about pesticides in food next. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. The Food and Drug Administration is releasing the results of its latest pesticide monitoring program, finding the vast majority of foods tested meet pesticide residue standards. 
This comes from AgriPulse. According to the FDA, more than 96% of domestic and 89% of imported foods were found to be well within the federally prescribed pesticide residue limits. No chemical residues were found in about half of the samples. This is also the second year of a special focus on glyphosate and glufosinate herbicides. Residues of those products were not found in any egg or milk samples and in about 60% of the corn and soybeans. However, none of the samples exceeded the levels. FDA did find that imported foods, in particular, salary carrots and raisins, had higher numbers of violations. A federal judge in San Francisco had ordered Stark, his company, to pay a fine of $100 million. It's a result of a canned tuna price-fixing conspiracy involving three companies. The Pittsburgh-based company had asked another judge to reduce the fine to $50 million. It argues a $100 million penalty could bankrupt the company because it still faces millions more in potential civil damages. Last year, Starkis pleaded guilty to a felony price-fixing charge. Online grocery spending has grown 15% in the past year, and now Walmart says it's expanding the reach of its Delivery Unlimited program. The program gives shoppers the option to pay $98 a year to receive unlimited Walmart grocery delivery. Customers place their orders online or use a Walmart app. They can then pick up their orders at stores without leaving their cars. Walmart says the program will expand to be available in more than 1600 stores and in more than 50% of the country by the end of the year. Farmers in Georgia were hit hard last year by Hurricane Michael, but it's a new year and farmers are hoping this year's cotton crop will help pull them through. We check out yields as harvest begins next. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Cotton harvest is underway and new crop progress numbers show 9% of the crop has been harvested. The five-year average is 8%. In Georgia, 4% of the crop is in, and that's already better than last year, when much of the crop was wiped out due to Hurricane Michael. Damon Jones from our friends at Georgia Farm Monitor shows us what kind of yields the state can expect to see this year. This will be the scene on a number of different farms across Georgia in the coming months as cotton growers prepare for harvest. Now, while the weather wasn't ideal during the growing season, this year's crop still appears to be a good one overall. It's especially hard this year on some of our later planted stuff where soil temps were over 100 and we were lacking moisture. Um, so that presented a challenge. We, we replanted probably more cotton this year than we have in, in several years before that combined. Um, rainfall, where rainfall has been limited, we've, we've, got a, we've got some poor cotton to be honest with you. Where we've had irrigation, we've done a fairly good job. Um, so if we can get the crop in, I think we'll be pretty happy altogether as far as yields go. Despite some of those difficulties, farmers should still have no problem getting their cotton out of the field on time, if not sooner. We picked cotton last Friday, and that's one of the first times we've picked cotton in August in a long time. But um, all in all, I'd say the crops, I'd say at least two to three weeks ahead. So um, as far as you know, looking at it from a standpoint of, of when we should be pulling the trigger and getting ready to get the harvester out, it's probably sooner than later. After suffering major damage from Hurricane Michael last year and Hurricane Matthew in 2016, the University of Georgia has been looking at ways to lessen some of the danger these kinds of storms present to the growers. And one of those is seeing just how early a crop can be planted without sacrificing its quality. But the big thing is we can't do anything about a hurricane. If a hurricane comes, it's going to blow cotton on the ground if it's, if it's susceptible to that storm. And what we mean by that is we, we don't want that entire crop to be uh, open to storm damage at one time. And the idea is, is that we can spread out our risk. In Georgia, we've got a, the opportunity there to, to spread out our harvest over a few months. Even though you're not likely to see a major change on when the seed goes into the ground for most of the crop, it is an option worth considering for some of it, despite the challenges it might create for the farmers. We know it's more difficult to potentially grow early cotton because you have less room for air. Um, but it can be done, and that's one of the things we're looking at is the different ways producers can impact the, the, the time it takes from the day we put that cotton seed in the ground to the day we get the picker out. Um, I don't think we're going to go to an early production system with cotton. We're not going to do that because our system works so well as it is now, but ultimately I think there's room for us to be able to pull some early and get some of that crop out earlier and spread that risk. But as for this year, there is plenty of optimism heading into harvest season, 
which is good news for growers looking to bounce back from a disastrous 2018. We, we did a lot of storm assessments last year and it, there's no doubt it hurt a lot of people extremely bad and a lot of a lot of farmers are still lucky to be here. Um, so we needed good cotton crop and, and all in all I think we've got it as long as we had the water um, and, and assuming we can get it in the picker this year. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. We're glad you tuned in. For all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Betsy Jibben. Have a great day.